there was a request about the Citizens Academy as well. So I'm going to share that again too because it's good for you to have. And I'm going to turn it over to Shelly while I try to get our other group a link to get in here. Uh, real, real quick, I just need to go ahead and say that this is this is the October 21st uh, CPOP meeting and this meeting is being recorded. Thank you, Brian. Perfect. Also, Ryan, is there is there anything that you can do to get our other guests into the meeting? What specifically are they having trouble with? Sharm, did, did they tell you what they're having trouble? Why they're oh, having I'm trouble I'm getting? Sending, I'm texting the link. Okay. Is it the event okay. right link or is it the um the WebEx link? WebEx. Okay. Yeah. Is that good? Yeah, that's the one. Perfect. Okay, good. Yeah, we're, we're definitely going to work on making um, streamlining being able to get into this meeting by, you know, the next time we have the meeting this. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's too difficult. I actually, Sharma, I actually did go to the Harvard Community Center today. And um, unfortunately, the meeting was yesterday. <laughs> so they did have it. And um, I, I spoke with, um, oh, I don't remember, Christian, I believe is his name. And so I asked him to put us on their email list. Um, I believe the next meeting is November 17th, same time at 10, 10 o'clock in the morning. And so we will um, make sure that, you know, we show up into the space. He says a lot of, a lot of good collaboration. And so that's exactly where, you know, where we need to be. And so, um, so welcome again, everyone. It's good to see, you know, all of our young people, especially. I'm so glad that uh, uh, Katrina, you are here this evening from the Cleveland Police Foundation. Thank you for showing up. You know, Omar Kelly and uh, James Egan from our Lot Leaders of Tomorrow Work Group. You know, thank you guys for showing up. Um, so as Commissioner Leon stated, you know, last last month we started talking about, you know. What exactly CPOP is? And again, you know, very overarchingly, it is community and police working together to solve problems in our neighborhood. But more than that, we are trying to solve them in such a way that they do not continue to be problems going forward. And so, um, as I was kind of, you know, doing some research, there are steps, there are steps to to this whole process. Um, things that we have found out is that when we do work with police, a um, couple of things happen. Uh, when we do work with police, first thing that happens is we're improving relationships with the police in our community. So that, that's number one, that's the goal. We are aiming to you know, make sure that community and police relations are definitely improved. And, and secondly, that crime is reduced again in such a way that it doesn't continue to repeat okay um the one thing that we kind of do right now is calls come in we send officers to the call and then we repeat so we want to stop that process um the cpop is a method that has been kind of tried and true it is not a new a uh, new way of doing things that has been around for a very long time. So the list that I'm going to go through are some things that again have been, you know, tried and are effective uh, when implemented, implemented um, the right way. Hello, Sam. <laughs> How are you? And so the first thing that we want to do when we're talking about CPOP is um, explore, explore the situation. OK, and as we go from community to community, I, I attend DPC meetings, ward meetings, you know, all kinds of community meetings. And as I'm attending all of these different meetings, I hear, you know, every community is unique and, um, you know, their culture, the way they do things and the problems that they have. And so things that are particular to the West Side are not um, uh, particular to, say, Fifth District. And so I listen to these. Um, I listen to all the issues that come up in the community. They are varied and many. So exploring some of those situations is the first step. And then secondly, um, formulating problems. And so 
when we talk about, for example, last night I attended fifth district's meeting and uh, Commander Morris, he allowed, you know, all the uh, community members to, you know, kind of put their voices into the room. One of the young ladies, she was a teacher at Wilson Element uh, Junior High School. And one of the things that she wanted to do was she wanted to have the police officers um, to be present in the morning when the children are coming to school and also be present when they're, you know, going home. She stated that there have been a couple of shootings in the area, one resulting in a homicide. And so her concern was to make sure the children are safe when they're coming and going, um, coming to school and going home. Um, there are parents who you know, some parents pick their children up, but there are a great many children who walk to school and so, or, or walk home from school. And so we wanna make sure that our children are being safe. And so when she put that concern into the room, there were two things that I heard, okay? First thing was that we have homicides, okay, happening. We have gunfire happening in our communities, okay? That's, that's first. And so that means that um, there is something happening there that is, um, that is a miss. Why do we have gunfire? Uh, which kind of speaks to our third action item. Um, select a specific problem for action, okay? Uh, fourthly, we would collect, uh, collect and process data. And so in looking at the issue that uh, that teacher put into the room, again, she said gunfire was going off, homicides were happening, children were unsafe. So we would, you know, begin this collection process. And actually, I'm going to let um, Ms. Katrina speak a little more to it because they have actually kind of gone through these steps of CPOP in such a way um, that I think is dynamic and, and, and awesome. But I do want to just kind of, you know, give you an overview of what the steps are. So again, you know, collecting and, um, you know, processing that data. And then fifthly, we would analyze the causes of the problem. You know, why are we having gunfire? Why are we having homicides? You know, what is what is the what is the root of that? Um, at a very superficial level, we have this happening. But what when we start to you know peel the layers of the onion back? Why are we having these types of issues in the community? Uh, then we would develop once we you know started to unpack the reasons why we would develop a solution, develop a plan. Okay. Now that we understand why we're having these things and the, the, the issues as to why could be many and varied. But once we have analyzed why it is that we're having all of these different issues, then we began to bring in, you know, different social service agencies to address, you know, the different reasons why we are having uh, gunfire and homicides go off in various uh, parts of the community. Um, then we would test the solution, test the solution. Um, and then evaluate the test results. That is going to let us know, you know, if it's working and if it's not, what areas need to be improved upon. Um, once we have a, a really good, I, I guess it would be a beta test or prototype, and then we would put it into play on a more wide scale. And then finally, the 10th step would be to reflect on that process again evaluate what things worked what things di didn't work and then you know repeat the process with another problem okay because cpop can be implemented um, for many different many different issues that come up in our community and so those are basically the the steps to doing cpop um, in our last meeting uh, the Cleveland Police Foundation was on and they said, you know, hey, we are we're already doing CPOP. We, we're, we're doing this already. We, we have a model prototype and everything. We're doing it. And so um, one of the things that we kind of wanted to do was to present to the community. because I think CPOP is this, this vague, you know, conceptual thing that nobody can really wrap their heads around. And so we want to give the community something very tangible, something very concrete, so that they can begin to understand what CPOP is and how we can use it to, again, create safer neighborhoods. And so with that said, I do want to give Ms. Uh, Katrina a chance to uh, talk about 
what it is that they are doing in the way of CPOP because they are actually doing it um, with the project that they are currently working on. And so, uh, Katrina, if you would uh, take over and just explain to them as you did to us your Safe Routes project. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Katarina Smiley, but you all can call me Kat. It's okay. Um, y'all, y'all can call me Kat. I apologize for not having my camera on. I'm doing a couple things at once. Um, but essentially, I am. I work for Digital C, which is a nonprofit focused on digital equity in the city of Cleveland, um, in partnership with the Cleveland Police Foundation. And uh, as of last year, we received a, a grant through the Department of Justice to implement. Uh, safe routes to schools um, within the city of Cleveland. And so what we've done, we've chosen three schools to sort of be our pilot schools um, for the first year. And then as with the, with the third year, uh, we plan to expand to a fourth. Essentially, it's comprised of three major components. One, we have our community care teams. Our community care teams essentially are going to be a combination of high school and college um, interns who are going to help us to be dispatchers um, with the Safe Routes to School mobile application that we're also developing. And so with that, we are using the CPOP model to help be a core component of our training for those community care agents. Um, and I'll get more into the, how this all works together in just a little bit. Um, I mentioned that mobile application. Um, this is really key um, because we recognize that um, though it's safe routes to schools, some students may not may, may not necessarily be concerned with safety um, getting to and from school, but we recognize that it may be an issue once they actually get into school. And so what this mobile application will do, it will help us to record um, issues within the student uh, community and help us to triage to existing organizations and partners who provide services who can help us to address these problems effectively. Um, I just wanna give a quick disclaimer, we're not trying to be a substitute for any mental health or behavioral health or law enforcement at all. Our goal is to sort of serve as that conduit um, and an advocate for students to help them um, make better informed decisions on their safety within and outside of the school walls. Um, and then lastly, we have our community programming, which will sort of house all these initiatives. So uh, we recognize that it's easy to say, okay, if we make this app, um, students will use it and they will record all their safety concerns and then safety will improve, violence will decrease in the city of Cleveland. We recognize that's not the case. So we have to actively work with students. Um, I'm a public health uh, graduate, so I tend to refer to that a lot. We need to have that prevention um, in order to have, in addition to the treatment measures that we're having. Um, so that after school sort of program will um, have academic support, mentoring support, as well as those community care agents to help in partnership with um, guidance counselors, safe route, I'm sorry, say yes coordinators and other in school resources um, to help students um, improve safety within their communities. Um, so just looking at the CPOP model, we found that it's a really great basis. Um, we've added our own sort of cultural lens to um, complement that. And so I'm really excited to rolling that out and sharing the results with you all um, as it develops. Thank you so much. Oh, if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you. And so, Kat, I do have a question. Um, right now, when we spoke, we were, sorry, I have a couple of questions. We were talking about, you know, partnering together, the Cleveland Police Commission and the uh, Cleveland Police Foundation partnering together. And now that I have, um, you know, some of our lot members on the call and other community members, you know, what does a, and, and I need the community to kind of weigh in on that. If we wanted to partner with the Cleveland um, Police Foundation, what does a partnership with them look like um, with Safe Routes? You know, um, I think it's a fabulous, fabulous concept. And um, I just want to know, how do we, how do we partner? Because well, again, oh, go sorry, ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I think first that partnership would look like helping us to um, develop training for our community care agents. We really want them to be well-rounded. So we are having them take mental health training courses um, as well as 
um, getting familiar with CPOP. But in addition to that, any existing resources, we know we're not the first ones to say, hey, we need to improve safety for our students. Um, so just really partnering together to, you know, stack hands and join resources, that would be super helpful um, in that way. Uh, we also are really interested in rolling out that academic support and mentoring piece as well. Uh, I don't have concrete details of what that all will entail just yet. Um, but I will say like volunteers and folks that can come in and help with subjects such as, you know, science, math, reading, those are all very important, as well as connecting our youth to uh, workforce development or other volunteer and civic engagement opportunities as well. That's something that we definitely need. And we also just want to just um, hear from community leaders on how we can best roll out this work. Um, and so I can drop my email in the chat if anyone's interested in sort of asking more questions or hearing more about it. Um, but ultimately we just wanna be um, a hub of resources for our students. Perfect, thank you so much. And also um, there was a question um, I was talking with one of my colleagues about um, uh, safe routes and and again, you know, help, you know, I'm, I'm, I think we're all still trying to you know, just uh, understand it. And so um, one of the things, as I was explaining it to her as best I could, and I, I hope that I didn't, you know, give misinformation, but, you know, she was asking how, how can we guard against making sure that the app doesn't fall into like predator hands? Oh, that's a good question. So the way we're rolling out the application is that um, students will have user accounts. And so I'm not, <laughs> my partner who is working on the technology piece isn't on the call today, but I'm just gonna give a very general overview. Um, so essentially we would like students on their way to school. So for example, if they see an abandoned building, they're saying, hey, you know, every day when I walk to school, there's this person standing outside of here. It's making me concerned, da, 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 da. Maybe they don't feel necessarily comfortable relaying that information directly to a law enforcement agent or what have you, um, but through their mobile app, they can anonymous, anonymously report an issue like that. Um, that issue will go to our uh, community care agent um, who will sort of reach out to, to the student to follow up and get more information about it. Um, and then they would relay that information to the appropriate uh, persons who are best equipped to handle it. How we will guard against predators, I would say that um, it mostly will be monitored by our community care team um, and they will be in-house. Um, they have a direct report with um, a member on our team who's responsible for managing them. And so that is something that we are very, very, um, it's very important to us that we do that as well as the data too, because we recognize that uh, students may or may not report insensitive information. And so making sure that that doesn't get into the wrong hands is something that we're working with our app developers to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, I do not have all the answers as of right now, so I am very much open to feedback, to suggestions, all of that. No, thank you. That was perfect. I, I, I like that response. So there, there will be constant um, vigilance guarding the, um, you know, people who who will be guarding the the app and the use of it um, to make Absolutely. sure that it's uh, safe for our, for our children. And Ms. Ruth, I see that you have your hand up. I do. Um, years ago. Uh, in the fourth district, we put together a safe passage route for the kids that walk to school. Sharma, you may remember this, but it was, um, we went along different routes and we identified things like the public library, uh, DCFS, you know, businesses that would agree to be a safe house that if, if a child was being chased or whatever, they could run into there. And the businesses signed an agreement that they would not release the child to, you know, to anybody except a law enforcement officer or you know, someone with proper identification or a parent, but they held the child there and they knew they knew they could run in there, uh, which is something you may want to look at too, because we did a, I, I'm on the stance committee and we did a, um, uh, Judge Sinnenberg did a uh, listening tour down at Juvenile, because so many of the young kids carry guns now. And somebody, they asked him and the overwhelming response was to protect their siblings from boyfriends or from people along the routes in school. Uh, there's a lot of gang activity out there. That's just real. 
you know, and they're, I mean, we're dropping like flies right now. And one of the things our kids told us, because uh, uh, our kids in summer camp, you know, everybody in the room knew somebody who had been killed, who had been shot, you know, such as this. And I was one of the ones, you remember the uh, Success Tech school shooting? Well, I was volunteering down where we were based down at uh, Wade Park. And I remember the look of those kids were absolutely terrified to come back to school. And they wanted to make sure everybody went through the metal detectors. And, you know, that today there were at least three or four fights in different schools. So it's, it's a big job. You know, and I definitely would pull one of the things that the safe house thing we pulled in is the churches, you know, the religious institutions, you know, things like that to be safe spaces. And, and the library was a safe space, you know, and some things like that, um, because these kids right now are scared to death. And a lot of the, some of the violence is going on because some of the kids don't take think they're going to live past 18. And so they're going to get what they can get. And, you know, so, I mean, it's bad. I mean, it's really bad. So we've got to do everything we can, but good job with what you guys have done so far. I think that's excellent. And to your point, Ms. Ruth, to your point, I was just say, stating that, yes, I believe that Safe Routes is, is awesome. I was having conversation with Peacemakers Alliance of Ohio and um, some other entities. As a matter of fact, I've had conversations with Peacemakers Alliance of Ohio twice, uh, twice now, today and uh, sometime last week. And they, speaking to what you were saying, were um, stating that lots of fighting uh, happening at the schools, rioting happening at the schools, lots of gun violence. Um, when I attend some of these DPC meetings, it's alarming the number of guns that are being taken off the street. And so for me, I want, I, I living in the community, I want to be able to live in the community. I do not want my children to, um, have to have a, a safe house that they can go to. Um, I, I don't. I want them to have full access to the entire community, full access to the entire community. So I believe that safe routes and safe havens, such as libraries and churches, those are great, you know, uh, first steps. Um, but ultimately, I, I, I believe the goal should be to ensure that my children can go outside and play, you know, two, three blocks away from me without me being very concerned about whether or not they're going to be hit with a stray bullet. Um, I need to be able to feel very safe and confident that I can send my, my, my seventh grader, my eighth grader, my ninth, tenth grader to school without worrying about if someone's parent is going to bring a carload of adults up to the school mm -hmm. and jump on them. Okay. I need to feel very confident that that does happen. I know I just had these conversations and it was breaking my heart and I, I just could not believe, I could not believe what I was hearing. I need to feel confident that if I live on 30th, that my son or daughter can walk through Morris Black without getting jumped and then come back around through Garden Valley without being stumped. I need to have access to my entire community. That is what I want. That is what I want for all of Cleveland, our children, our working class adults, our elderly. Everyone needs to be able to feel safe where they live. And so that that is what I would like for us to, you know, to have as a goal, you know, as, as a work group. We need to be able to create very safe spaces to, um, Samantha, you said in our meeting on Monday. Um, the I'm going to go ahead and jump in and make a point before it becomes stale. Oh, if I can. Go ahead. Um, just real quick. I understand there was, you know, we sort of talked about what about the use of predator, you know, people with this particular program or, or possibly programs like in the future. There was a bit of a concern about people like predators and that, and that kind of thing. It's important to remember that the vast majority of violence is interpersonal violence. It is far more likely that someone is going to have a have a have a parent or someone they know come after them than have a totally anonymous stranger go after them. And so I think that sometimes we often get bogged down into oh, what about you know this? You know, there there could be people you know kind of you know unknown people kind of in the shadows. It's 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 sort of the devil you know the sort of devil present you know is 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 the bigger threat in in, in most of these circumstances. And I think that's what people have been saying has come out. It's not, it's a random stranger adult who, who 
comes up in a pickup truck and just starts trying to abduct kids. It's a coordinated effort of people to hurt someone they know. So just, I think that sometimes we, 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 we tend to get stuck on that and just, you know, be aware that that's, the, it does happen, but it happens with far greater, less frequency than, than it would be to, you know, you wouldn't want to like discontinue this program because you were afraid that that might happen. Like you think that it could do all this good with this some risk here. You kind of have to, you have to keep things proportional. That's all Shelly, sorry to interrupt. I wanted to jump in earlier, but I wanted that point before we like moved on entirely. Thank you, Ryan. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And so, um, I do want to, you know, kind of turn it back over to, cause I know that we're, you know, um, we have time that we need to consider. So I kind of did want to turn it back over to any of the um, persons who are on the call, if they had questions for Ms. Kat or about anything that has been said, or if you have, you know, something that you, you know, want to throw into the room as um, a potential area that we can look at to and begin to employ CPOP. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Hassan Rogers. Um, I'd like to um, address some of the concerns, and particularly with the um, with the app. I think that's a great idea. Twenty first century, as a guy who works with children, uh, I, I see educators wrestling with trying to take their phones from them, when in reality, that that those phones aren't going anywhere. So the more we can utilize that, better. Uh, what, what uh, Ms. Stanfield brought up about the safe houses, I remember the institution of those safe houses. Uh, if we look at the corridor of East 131st from Kinsman to take it to Miles, if we look at that corridor, and this is going in, uh, this is in response to those safe houses, we need to look at buy-in for the early morning hours. See, a lot of these children, are they're on their way to school between 7.30 and 8.30 in the morning. And a lot of businesses, particularly the churches and libraries, they're not open. You know, and so, and this, see, I'm a guy, I grew up in Garden Valley. So I, I know about walking through Old Cedar when we were bused to Central from Rawlings. They closed one poor junior high school to send us to another poorer junior high school. But we made friends with our buddies in Althwaite, our buddies in Carver Park, or, or what we, and down the way, what we call Dirty 30. You know, we made friends with those guys, and that stopped all of those territorial issues that used to be in place, because the only time all those people got together was at East Tech. But then you're 16 years old, so the divisions were serious. Well, uh, one thing that busing did do, all the, all the damage that it did, but one of the positive things it did, is that it opened up some neighborhoods uh, that were close to each other. So now there is no longer that long-standing feud between Garden Valley and Main Kennedy or Garden Valley and 40th. And what Ryan said, you do have interpersonal squabbles. All of these shootings that are happening in the 4th District, believe it or not, those things generated with two families who grew up together. These are two families. This is a, this is a modern-day Hatfield and McCoy. So, and that's not speculation, that's not my opinion, that's my association. So, knowing that we have more at play than just, um, is it, do the street lights come on? You know, like in, in our neighborhoods, the street lights aren't even on. So, if you have to walk down East 108th Street between Sandusky and Union, it's pitch black. It's pitch black. You know, so you're a young lady, you're worried about the abandoned houses. I mean, I know we have gang units and that are, that are at the schools and I see the gang officers in the office with their feet up on the desks. If we're going to let that gang, make sure that gang unit has that app downloaded as well so that they can be in the troubled corridor. We need police presence in that corridor. We need grown up presence in that corridor. That East 131st corridor from from Kinsman on down to Miles. And I, I'm a West Sider now, but I'm born and raised on the East Side. Uh, also that 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 East 93rd corridor where we had and we had women being taken, murdered, and left in abandoned houses. There are Catholic schools that are still abandoned and up on Sandusky, on Orleans, all along East 93rd, between Kinsman and Miles. 
So we need the city, we need this program to be in touch with City Hall because those abandoned schools, they need to be raised. The, the, go, go along those streets because the Catholic Church was big, but once the Catholic Church left, all those abandoned school buildings are still little kid who in places you shouldn't be. Old girl walking home past that. There are some. There are some stranger dangers. There are some stranger dangers, particularly in that area. Pull up the the registered the registered sex offenders. You will see them. Those registered sex offenders. You will you will see where they are in the zip codes and in those streets, and you'll see concentrations of them in the Buckeye, Kinsman, Union area. So. But the mental health facility that was housing and treating people, that's gone. So we do have more unstable individuals in the community than before. We do have less community engagement because of lack of funding. And the children are left to fend for themselves. So in this instance, if that app is going to, let's not downplay the importance of that app. Let's really, let's really get, get buy-in. Look at uh, partnering with your radio stations. Children love music. Heck, I'm an artist. I love music. But you've got to partner with the radio stations. You've got to partner. But look at partnerships with any streaming service. They may be open to community relations and outreach, community relations outreach. We have to think in every way that children are accessing the broader world. So RTA has to be a part of it. Uh, the bus drivers. They have to be their eyes and ears, and we don't get any feedback from the bus drivers. Anyone in this group, have you got any feedback from Cleveland Municipal School bus drivers? I'm asking. No, see, so things like that, we have to be in touch with people who are on the ground. The bus driver, their eyes and ears, they're right there every day. So the people who apply for the school crossing guards, they, that position, they need that app. The paraprofessionals, the teachers, yeah, you got to deal with the teachers union, but it could be voluntary. They need the app. Everyone that has their hand and their eyes and ears related to the children, they need the app. I want the app. I think it's a great idea. Uh, I, I think this, it would be great if we could, I know it's hard, and, and, and Shalina, I know you're, you're out here pounding the pavement. Um, don't be afraid at looking at... Uh, some, if you guys have some resources, try to get over to Corey, try to get over to Greater Abyssinia, try to get over to some places that have access to the, to the community and you can use their platform as well. Because Corey, uh, I don't know if they still operate the rec center, but Corey was, is a magnet on 105, just like Fairfax is a place uh, you know, in, in that community. So we gotta access the community centers, uh, because of COVID, we know we're not gathering the way we were. So the school is a great place to meet everyone. It is. A... I have to second everything he said. Um, because we the artists have... in the schools with the children in my, in, you know, from, from the city with the city at my heart. So, you know, we, we have something in our community. Uh, there's a bus stop about a block from my house. And there's four sexual predators who live within a block of that. Of that. So the grownups take turns going out and watching the kids waiting on the bus. Just something that simple. It's, you know, we'll be out there with our coffee, just watching them just to make sure. Because it's really hard, you know, even though sexual predators are not supposed to live within a certain distance of a school, they do. And I have called them on the carpet um, at city hall and council meetings, and everything else like that, about why can't you make the move? And they, I was told, well, the law director has to make a move. And so far, they've made zero of a move. So what does that say? And Brother Hassan, you probably know the person I work with, Khalid Samad. Yeah, I love Khalid Samad. I, I, I work with Peace him, in the give Hood. Give him a hug from Hassan. Okay. <laughs> I, I work with Peace in the Hood. We have an after school program up there, at, you know, on Mount Pleasant now. Okay. And we can't let our kids even go across the street to their ninnies anymore. I know. I know. Okay. I mean, they can't leave the building. I mean, it's it's unfortunate, but they can't. 
because it's just too much right there. It, um, I, I'm saddened, to be honest with you, I'm saddened. I'm saddened by it. As, as a grown-up who really loves this city and, uh, you know, I, I it, even I know, I know uh, Shalina brought up some points that, you know, we want to be able to access the entire community. I, it's one of those harsh realities. It's almost like we're in a time warp. And if you ever wonder, what would it be like living in the Roaring Twenties or the Wild Wild West, where we're living in that? Area because we do have dead zones. We do have, they've always been there though. When I was growing up, those green police cars didn't make it in the valley. When you called the police in 1978 and in 1977, they weren't coming to the valley, you know, and there was no private police force up the hill in those private apartments. So it's, there's always been zones where anything goes, literally anything goes. And, and those children, they live in those zones. When you live in 44104, 44105, 44108, 44106, except the Cleveland Clinic, of course. If you don't live in the Cleveland Clinic, those zip codes right there, those are barren. You do what you want to do. You literally can do what you want to do. And that, uh, you brought up a good point. We do have to get grownups involved. You know, we do. We have to get grownups involved. Ryan, you brought up, you, you mentioned that it's not strangers uh, in vans, but over here at Wilbur Wright, right around the corner from my house, there was a stranger that tried to grab a boy. Now, there are strangers that try to grab you, but we don't have anywhere to report it. And that's where the app comes in. You know, when something strange happens at 425 and you walk on home from your friend's house, you're happy to book it up and make it home. You don't think about, oh man, who can I tell? But you're right, with that app, and it can be a personal interaction, that could be a game, that could be a game changer. Mm -hmm. But because we, here's what we need, we need to know this tip. Daquan is coming to school tomorrow and he's going to F up somebody. We need that tip about Daquan shooting. We do. We need that tip. I don't know if we can monitor, you know, if we can do any type of incentives, like uh, get in touch with Crime Stoppers, you know, get in touch with the Cleveland Police Department and say, do we have any monetary incentives the same way we do for tips and, and, and incentivize it? Because we know money talks. There's a reason why uh, people get caught, because someone turns them in. So, so money talks, you know, it, it, it's, uh, it, it, it's something that we, we can't throw enough darts at. There can't be enough nets. There can't be enough ideas. All of it matters. I really do believe that all of it matters. Uh, when I sit on my porch and the little guy that rides his bike, he sees me and I say, all right, I see you holding that Willie a little longer, young man. Now he's going to stop his friends from throwing rocks through my window. No, don't break his car. That's my dude. You know, that, that really happens. That happens. Let me, if I could steal 30 seconds. I used to live on East 76 in St. Clair. I was a young man in my 20s. But I, I worked at a, a, one of the pro, uh, proprietary schools. And I came, you know, shirt and tie. I came home. I was sitting on my porch drinking a beer. And it was a couple of teenagers. And they said, hey, hey, Hassan. They didn't call me Mr. Rogers. They called me by my first name. They said, Hassan, we, we're still in every car that's on the street tonight. If it's not in the driveway, we're stealing it. I said, y'all gonna steal my car, man? He said, I'm telling you, we steal it every car. Now, when I got up in the morning, I was so relieved to see my car in front of my house. I got in the car, started it up, and was driving up uh, 76 and was ready to turn right on Norman or Corman. That's the name of it, Corman. And the steering wheel just kept spinning. They had stripped the steering column. <laughs> But they told me they were going to steal every car on the street, you know, so we can't be so out of touch with the uh, that part of youth to be between 12 and 18. You're going to do some stuff. So we have to open up our hearts and minds to understanding that and look at programming. Let's let's look at programming. I played sports at Eagles Nest on East 55th. I met a lot of guys through sports. That's not going to go away. Guys like sports. We have to push that angle. I don't care if it's uh, let's play a kickball tournament in the snow. Make it a big deal. We and we have to to grab it, grab what we have accessible to us. That uh, the Emerald Necklace and that George Forbes uh, campsite. Every kid in the Cleveland School District should say, "Hey, we had a blast at at George Forbes," but they can't. They can't. And why don't they say that? Because no one has prioritized that. 
Go ahead, Ryan. I'm I'm monopolizing the time. Yeah, I'm gonna have to we gotta access our access what we do have available that doesn't cost us any more. We already have the buses, we already have George Forbes, we already have these things in place. And let's look at bringing them together in a more cohesive manner so that they can there's interplay between them. That's it. I'm muting my mic. All right. So now it's gonna be time for some really unpopular opinions. Uh I know that uh, people have been commenting about, you know, there's a bunch of sex offenders at one in one area, one neighborhood. That's a very complicated issue, but it is worth remembering that only 10% are in the state of Ohio. Only uh, 11% of sex offenders commit a sexual related crime after being after serving their time in prison. So the recidivism rate actually is actually a lot lower than people suspect, probably because there is so much monitoring and, and whatnot. Uh, and I know that's a complicated issue, but I, I do think that we do need to be clear is about um, um, <clears throat> uh, someone in the comments had said, we know where the bad guys are and where they live. Well, we know where people who have committed crimes in the past live, but there is a U.S. Constitution and there are laws that say you can't just go and harass somebody or monitor them extra, cost, extra, extra constitutionally because they have committed a crime. That's the constitution, that's law. I know people do that sometimes. It doesn't mean it's 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 the right thing to do or it's it's legal. And the final Debbie, the final thing I'm gonna that's gonna be an unpopular opinion is um children or kids today have a really, really fine-tuned bullshit detector. And a lot of if what they perceive is as a top-down program being encouraged by adults. It's not going to be a huge, the incentive structure for them to sort of go along with that is going to be limited. There, there's the famous um, sketch where Steve Buscemi dresses up like a teenager, uh, like a kid. He says, hello, fellow teenagers. Uh, and, I, I, and some of the, I think, concern when we go into this is if, if this just appears to be adults imposing something on kids, it's not going to have the same resonance as as peer-to-peer -peer connections would, just as something to remember going uh, going forward. And so that's my. I'd like to respond to that if that's okay. Sure. Um, so a big part of what our program is based off of is ba is genuine and authentic connections. Um, we go off a, a intergenerational type model. And so what our after school programs would entail, I'm so glad you said that we need that peer to peer initiatives because what, one of the things we took into consideration with this application is that we don't want it to be referred to as, you know, the snitch app, right? Where folks think that law enforcement are moder monitoring it. And so they don't even feel comfortable enough reporting it because it's like, do they have my phone number? Does it like, for example, I know that the RTA has an app where I, it's five, seven eyes or something like that, where it claims to be anonymous, but in actuality, they capture your phone number, right? Just to follow up with you, this, that, and the third. And while that may not be a, a big problem to some, I know as a youth who grew up in Cleveland schools, also from 152nd in St. Clair, uh, knowing that that's an issue. It, I don't feel comfortable with that. If I don't have a great relationship with law enforcement, I'm not going to feel comfortable with that, which is why we're so intentional in making that after school component with our um, young people, specifically in the elementary grades, because we recognize once they get to high school, it's a little bit harder to steer them in certain directions. It's not impossible, but it is more difficult. And that's why we're intentional in saying, hey, okay, you guys know the issues that's going on both inside of the school and outside of the school. What are some of your ways? What are some safety interventions we can come up with together um, and implement within your community? Is that a kickball day? Is that a day at the rec centers where we have X, Y, and Z events? Really letting the youth sort of lead the way and as adult facilitators, just helping them to amplify their message and get their point across, as well as appointing them with the appropriate resources resources to help that inter intervention come into fruition. Um, I definitely think that's a good idea. And then I see in the chat that Ms. Ruth said something about talk to us, not at us. And I think that's really the approach we're trying to take here is that our youth know um, who, what teachers they can trust. They know what people in the community are cool. They know who they can go to for if they need, you know, money for this, or they need, you know, a ride here, a ride there. They know these things. So it's like, how can we how can we take all of that sort of like, um, what is the, what's the word I'm looking for? Like informal sort of information and really 
centralize it in a place where it's accessible to students or educators can go and say, hey, you know, I recognize this student came in and had this issue. Is there anything going on? How can I better help serve? Our community, our community care agent can say, you know, the issue why, you know, this student is having a problem um, with bullying, because that's the number one concern when we looked at reports from the existing anonymous app that CMSD has is bullying. Why is that child being bullied? It's because they don't have clean clothes. Is it because they don't have, you know, up to date shoes? Is it, it why, why are they not coming to school? Is it because of those things? So really looking at that and taking that data that's youth driven um, to sort of drive these, um, these interventions is key for us. So thank you for bringing that point up. Absolutely, and, and we, we're having such great engagement. Um, I, I specifically, you know, invited um, our lot members that you see, James Egan, Omar Kelly and Samantha Montanez um, they have been uh, a part of something that we have that is awesome and dynamic going on. It's, um, uh, it's a, a project by MIT, Reimagining Public Safety. And so they too are supposed to come up with, um, you know, something very innovative. And um, so I, I really wanted you guys to, to meet and connect and I wanted them to hear, you know, what the Cleveland Police Foundation has going on um, so that, you know, we can again begin to um, expand on what it is that, um, we would like to move forward with with the MIT project. And so I don't know, James, Omar, Samantha, do you guys have, you know, any comments or, you know, uh, how do you feel about um, what you've heard so far? How do you feel, feel about um, partnering, you know, with the Cleveland Police Foundation, uh, your thoughts, your ideas? Um, well, if I could say something, I would say that uh, when I initially approached the uh, MIT Reimagining the public safety project, uh, I had the mindset of constructing something that actively involve um, physical. What's the word I'm looking for? Physical attributes. For example, like a safety team of some sort, or some sort of a thing that involves person-to-person -person contact. And the app def definitely does still involve person-to-person -person contact because a person has to download it. But I wasn't thinking very digitally. However, after talking to Shelly personally, or Commissioner Williams uh, personally, uh, about uh, this idea and hearing it um, from the horse's mouth herself, I can say that now I am, my wheels are definitely turning and more open to how can we integrate technology into it because it's not going anywhere right you know what I'm saying there's some people who idolize brick and mortar because of the nostalgia and because of the physical contact and what that brings to the uh, i guess emotions when dealing with it however like i said it's not going anywhere technology that technology that is so i definitely this idea has opened my brain waves to start thinking about how can we incorporate technology into this because it's an asset to our community so yeah Thank you. Uh, thank you for sharing your greatness and inspiring me to think differently is, is, is my opinion on it and my thoughts and how I feel. Your mic's off, Shelly. I was just saying awesome. Uh, I, I'm sorry, go ahead, Sharon. <laughs> oh, she caught, she called on me. She called me out. That was all. Um, no, what I was, well, hi everyone. I know I've been like really quiet on this call. My name is Samantha Montanez, lot member. Um, I agree with Omar. Um, Katarina, your idea is amazing. And also, um, we worked together before when you invited me over the summer to. Yes. The I yes. Knew you were familiar. <laughs> yes. So I would love to actually set up to discuss this further because. I'm also all about working smarter, not harder. So if there is already something that is potentially in works and thought, and it can um, contribute to the mission, I'm all about collaborating. And again, like I said, working smarter, not harder. So I would love to sit down and talk more about this app and, and discuss more about this idea and see where it fits in with the uh, initiative with MIT to potentially get that funding because um, it's a great funding opportunity to be very honest. Um, and my the wheels in my brain are also turning um, 
especially as I uh, was listening to Mr. Rogers or how whatever you prefer. I don't know. You can say that's cool. <laughs> I, I like to be respectful of adults. Um, but I, my wheels were turning with that as well because I grew up in the rec centers. Like that's a big part of my identity and. Uh, recreation centers are cornerstones in our communities, and I don't think people really view them as that, but um, they're very, 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 I am an adult, but I'm a baby. But anyways, they're very important. Um, and so just finding those places in our communities where our children can go to be safe is super important. Um, and um, I just, yeah, that just has like, my brain going as well so um i would love to sit down and chat more about it and there are levels to adulthood so but yeah those are my thoughts absolutely i would love to connect can you drop your email in the chat so we can just i can just set up like a zoom or something with you yeah no problem and Miss Sharman, there is levels to this adulthood. You got to, I'm a level one. You know this. You are so right about that. And um, Sam, if you, okay, you already put it out there. If that, that's fine. She's online. Um, but if you wanted, <laughs> if you wanted to send it, I could have, I texted to Kat because um, it's a public um, forum. So, um, James. Yep. Hey, everyone. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Should double check where I am. Yeah, awesome. Uh, so James James Egan, one of the other block group members. Um, Sam brought up a really interesting point um, that I wanted to explore more is uh, working smarter, not harder. Because I think what we've seen a lot with the MIT challenge um, is a lot of business related training for starting a, a, a startup basically. Um, and, and this is something that would interest me a lot more that's already established. It's a plan in place. Um, to actually uh, help. I know with the MIT challenge, uh, two things that would concern me with the, the app is that I think this year's applications, you can't really submit. Well, now that I'm thinking about it, they it could still be submitted for funding approval. They just couldn't go through the uh, incubator. You could still submit for funding. I believe that application is still open. Um, I believe the application for that is due November 19th for the yeah. actual, Thing. The incubator was an opportunity for uh, for us to learn more and potentially refine an idea. So you didn't have to do the incubator to do the other. Right. So you still can um, apply. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, James. You're good. You're all good. Kind of help me out there. Um, so yeah, that that happened. And how it's actually uh, not sure how far along you are in piloting and where it's at on the ground. Um, that's something that's really interesting. Um, I had the steps and something. Um, if you're willing to include me on that meeting, that'd be great. I know my schedule gets pretty busy, but um, can I can I can I suggest something to uh, Kat and the other lot members? Um, so, so so because the uh, final application is due November nineteenth, and separately, this is an idea that uh, you have independently. Um, what if we i want you i don't want to use the word partner because that takes away the uh the almost uh, the work that you put in this is this is definitely your baby you know but you know this is a, i believe this is actually a, a really really great idea and um, the more hands on deck the more uh outreach that we can have and the more the larger our wingspan so if you're interested in expanding this idea and adding team members i'm very interested in incorporating this idea and and possibly getting the MIT to fund it. That would be amazing. Please don't shy away from partnership. I'm all about community building and just wherever we can get in, we can fit in together is I, I appreciate all of that. I think that would be super helpful because ultimately my goal is like to do our very best here in Cleveland so that this could serve as a national model. For, for young people to feel empowered to implement these safety interventions and lead these safety interventions with the support of trusted community members um, to help them do so along the way. So absolutely, I would love to partner with you on this. If you could drop your email as well, I would appreciate it. For sure, for sure. I love this engagement. It is so awesome. I love it. I absolutely love it. 
And so, um, are there any other questions, concerns? Um, I see Bev is on uh, is on the call. Hey, Bev. <laughs> And I put my email in the chat for everyone, by the way. Awesome. Thank you. I would in like um email. if thank you. If um uh, Mr. Gransberry care to um come off mute and, and speak to if you want to add anything to what you put in the chat. If not, the chat is fine. Thank you for your engagement. Um we absolutely do um believe in community responsibility and engagement, right? And one of the things that we've said a lot here are those who can do, because we also acknowledge the environment and the situations that people find themselves in in our community. Um, and we know that as the water rises, all boats rise. You, uh, Hassan spoke to um, uh, the families that are the modern day Hatfield and McCoys, right? So we have families that that have um, individuals in the family who engage in criminality. And there are families who, you know, will assist them in that. I remember being on patrol in the fourth district and we had a mob barker, I'm telling you, you're right. Um, <laughs> She wasn't giving up her folks for nothing and they were involved in everything. Exactly. You'd be like, you're not helping, Ma, you're not helping, right? Um, uh, so, but folks who show up to do the work and like we talked about, and that's why we really let the engagement go on because this is everything that we're doing. We're here as a community working on issues. And um, all those, you know, the main engage, the main focus of, uh, CPOP is to elevate the voice of the community in engagement and problem solving with the Cleveland Division of Police. We're not going to stop the momentum of, of community working together as well, because then we all get in where we fit in. Like Kat said, um, I'll often think about, because I'm a few levels up, you know what I'm saying? It's levels to this adulting thing. All of you levels up there, right? And so I have go gone in the space where I really am okay taking some direction from younger people who are closer to the problems, who are closer to how younger adults or young people engage, how they get their information, how they share or get their news, how they share those things. And I know that even though, and Kat will tell you, Sam will tell you, I've always kicked it with young people because, you know, I like to stay informed, but I, I just also love the um, energy and the creativity and still the belief in so many possibilities and our greatness of young people. I still see through the, the, the views of a 50 year, 51 year old woman. And so, what I can bring is that um, uh, stability, that wisdom, sometimes resources, <laughs> right? So um, I like to be able to uh, give at the level that I'm at now and, and be okay with saying, I have some, all, some of these ideas, <laughs> but sometimes when I share those ideas with the young folks, are like, excuse me, huh? what? Yeah, yeah, no, we're not doing that no more. <laughs> you know, we, that, we're not about that life anymore. And I just got to be like, okay, but okay, what are we doing? How are we doing this then? You tell me, I'll follow you, right? Um, and this is all a part of that. Uh, we are at 6.07 and let me see, there's more to chat. Let me check and see if there was anything that I missed. Okay, I'm gonna take Mr. Gransberry, but you are good. Um, we tell our youth to put aside their differences, yeah, what they have, and, and we need to do that. Amen. Um, so just so we make sure that we cross our T's and dot our I's with our responsibilities. Has there been anyone other than the um, police commission, uh, staff, or commissioners that have attended any of the district 
um, uh, meetings this past month. Anything you want to share, anything that we could take back or that you need assistance or advocacy in. I'll give a couple of uh, moments for anyone to jump in with that. And then uh, we'll go to the next thing. Unless there, and, it, and if there was anything else about the conversation that's already been had that someone also wanted to piggyback on, that would be fine. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say thank you, uh, Shalina, for inviting me. And uh, guys, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna go because it is football, and I got some stuff to do for the game. <laughs> so I gotta go. I really gotta go. But I will say this uh, for anyone who would like to. One of the things that children do like they love content. And as an artist, a theater artist, and a video and all that, and voiceover stuff, you know, I'm big on content and creating and using our experiences to express ourselves artistically. So I'm all for creating drama programs and all that stuff. I will say this, this is my 30th season. And yeah, Hassan costs is a reason why he's, you can hear it's a reason. We, we're not, we should not let costs bother us anymore. We have to begin to think top down as opposed to bottom up. So whatever it takes, there, there are grants, there are funds available. We have to respect the individuals who we want to work with the children and realize some of us are out here every day. I can go to Mary McLeod Bethune. I can go to Alfred E. Bennett. I can go to East Tech because I'm out here every day in it. So, but, but that cachet, I wouldn't mind cashing that in because there are children who want to express themselves. And we may not be able to prevent everything, but if we can help one person, just one cat, you know, that makes a big difference. I was walking Edgewater this summer, young man with his, his beautiful uh, braids. He, he's tall, tall, you know, young. He, he walked over to me. He said, I heard your voice. I heard you laughing. You that dude with that drum and you tell the stories to the kids? I said, yeah, that's me. That's me. He said, you have me and Mary McLeod. He said, my, this is my boy, Hassan. <laughs> and that just tickled me. That tickled me because he, he's talking about a 2008 program. You know, that, that's a long time ago. So the work we do as grownups, it does resonate with them. And well, like you said, they can see through your bullshit. But I stood in free lunch line. So I don't have no problem resonating with everybody. I stood in free lunch line. I got my bologna on the hamburger bun. I got my pizza. I got my fish on Friday. All of it. <laughs> and that nasty jello cup. <laughs> so thank you guys for having me. And uh, I look forward to hopefully partnering with somebody Duly noted, Mr. Hassan. That's what's up, sister. I'll talk to y'all. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you for coming. Thank you for Thank coming. I just want to chime in before you guys go. Um, most of my comments have been in the chat. So, Shamani, thank you for inviting me to go live. Uh, again, I just want to reiterate there's some beautiful ideas out here. Um, I'm offering, because I'm a retired individual, I'm offering some of my time and energy to help support this platform. Uh, I've been in Cleveland for about 11 years now. I'm not a Cleveland native. However, I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and we share some of the same problems and concerns in the neighborhoods there, which I track on a regular, you know, and we're all looking to try and resolve some of the issues that are occurring in the major cities across the country. Um, one young lady said that the collaboration is something that may lead to something that we can get out there to the masses across the nation. You guys, I think that's important and essential. So I just, I just, I appreciate the time and energy that everyone here has put into this. And I look forward to, I put my email in there. I look forward to doing some things if you're allowed me to. Thank you for that. We got it. Believe that. Thank you so much. Any other feedback from our so, previous conversations or um, so, any district committee participation? Um, the only thing I, I kind of wanted to um, talk just a tiny bit about is um, in the way of, you know, we can partner so many different ways with uh, safe routes. You know, one of the ways that we kind of discussed um, was the, the ASU conference training to get that CPOP training actually up under our belts 
you know, so that, I mean, we, we, we ha definitely have something very tangible here. We, we have CPOP rolled out for us. Um, but to have, you know, that, um, that academic piece behind us, I think that that would be something that I would, you know, like to see this this group, um, you know, as a committee go through the training together. And I know that the training isn't until April, but maybe that is something that we can consider. That would be awesome. I know I can speak for my team when I say that that's a conference that we've been looking into like already. So I think that would be a really good um, resource for the team in developing this project. I agree as well. It's not until April, did, did you say? <clears throat> <clears throat> so we need to start looking, making sure that uh, we can get in there. <clears throat> I think it'll be an excellent um, training because I believe we should have had that when we first started as commissioners. That would have that would have made things a lot easier for us, you know, to really get a good grasp, especially if we don't come from law enforcement. Is there any other questions or concerns about the training? <clears throat> Commissioner Leon, did you have anything else to say? Now, Shelly. So then the only other thing, the only other thing is we had also, there, there are two CPOP plans that are currently in place. There's the CPOP plan from the Cleveland Police Department written by Commander Johnny Johnson and um, two sergeants. And then there is, a, a, and, and Commissioner Leon, I believe you were one of the chief architects of the uh, CPOP plan from the CPD that has been adopted, you know, by uh, Judge Oliver. But then there's the there's the yeah the other CPOP plan written by the the families. Um, and and so again, this may or may not be something we want to do. Um, think about blending the two, but that's you know just something that's um, you know to be considered maybe at a later time. Sure, we want to. Yeah. Ryan, did you have any last thoughts? And thank you for joining us, Ryan. Oh yes. Uh, no, I'm, I'm always happy to be here. My one, my, my I would say is, is my, my final thought is, I was very looking at the Safe Routes program. I think this is an excellent, concrete example of what CPOP could be. And I think that that has been so far kind of the thing that's been eluding us uh, in this in, this entire time. Because as I was talking with 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 uh, Shelley, we er, everything we've tried to impose has been we, from the top systematic level. Say this system's going to change. We're going to put this into place. We're going to do it like that. And while often sometimes you do you know that that is an that can be a very important component of things. Another way to sort of go about doing systemic change is by doing it on the small level, small level, small level. And over time, as that builds into a consensus, then you have that becoming becoming a system in itself, becoming, you know, um, the, 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 the becoming the systematic way things are done. Because that is how all systems originally occur. It is the small actions that build to the larger systemic thing. Of course, once it's there, it becomes you you know we you all know about different you know I don't know how that works, um, but this is sort of a way to um, you know a way to there, there's no guarantee it will succeed in in sort of becoming the sort of new systemic approach, but it, it it's a building block to sort of become it from on a very sort of granular level, um, which is why I I I, 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 I um you know. I think that's so. I'm, I'm very op, I'm optimistic for, for, from that from from that perspective that this sort of thing is capable of working, and that this sort of organic process, you know, can exist in reality. So that was all. Thank you so much. And I know tonight the Browns are playing prime time, so everybody's anxious to put their jerseys on and get their chicken wings and <laughs> all that good stuff. So uh, we are going to yield your time back. 
Thank you. This was a powerful conversation. Kat, thank you so much for coming on. We are very excited to work with you, our lot members, our commissioners. Um, I mean, it's just really powerful to have a the work that you've done. We applaud you. Um, it, it's just great. So we'll continue these conversations uh, so we can make this happen and collectively make it happen together. And as Sharm always used to say, always says, we have to get to the community. We have to hear the community's voice. And tonight was a powerful conversation that we had tonight. We were listening to each other, agreeing with each other. Uh, Kat, you're definitely making some tangible steps, you know, with CPOP. And we appreciate your work. And with that, I'd like to say good night to everyone. Enjoy the game. Go Browns. And uh, we'll see you guys next month. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Take care. You too. Take care. Thank you. Have a good night.